the Environmental and Water Resources Podcast in the Civil Environmental Engineering Department at Colorado State University, brought to you by EWRI CSU, where we get to know CSU professors, water environmental professionals, and learn about their work. I'll be one of your hosts today. My name is Ben Schott. I'm currently the podcast manager for EWRI CSU. I'm a PhD student in Civil Environmental Engineering, I'm focusing in hydrologic science and engineering. I'm your other host. My name is Liz Byron. I am pursuing a master's degree in civil engineering with a focus in hydraulic engineering and stream restoration. I am the current EWRI vice president. Um, and today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Peter Nelson, who happens to also be my advisor. Um, so Peter Nelson is a associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at CSU. Um, he received his Bachelor of Science in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Princeton University, and he received his PhD in Earth and Planetary Science from the University of California at Berkeley. His dissertation was on bed surface patchiness in gravel bed rivers. He is currently the Borland Chair of Hydraulics at CSU um, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and he is the Moroni Family Chi Epsilon Faculty Teaching Award uh, winner of 2019. So welcome, Peter. Thanks for being here. How are you today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Doing quite well, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, My we're first really happy podcast to have you. ever. So <laughs> pretty fun. Out. Awesome. <laughs> I'm excited to be able to see your uh, cat here as That's, well. This is William Tail. He decided to join. Hello, William. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in here. And I guess if you could just sum us up, I know we gave a little bit of background, but just tell us a little bit more about your academic or um, interests, kind of your vocational passions or interests. Um, just to kind of generally characterize your field of expertise and why you generally focus on. Sure. Um, so just a, a little more background on myself. I grew up in Washington State. I'm from Spokane originally. And actually the high school that I, that I attended had a river running through the campus. And so um, I've sort of been interested in rivers for my entire life. Um, I went to Princeton for my undergraduate degree. I didn't really know what I wanted to work on, what I wanted to major in, but I ended up sort of settling into civil and environmental engineering civil and environmental engineering once I realized that that field gave me the opportunity to do work in rivers and work on the outside and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I've been in that field ever since. Um, in, uh, actually, when I was in college, I came to CSU in the summer of 2002 uh, for an RU, a Research Experience for Undergraduates program. And I did a research project on the um, Arkansas River Valley with Tim Gates as my faculty advisor. Um, and so that gave me, I, I think, a, a strong love of doing research. That was kind of my first real research experience. And then um, as a, a senior in college, I had to do a senior thesis. And so I did some work on uh, urban hydrology in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and then that sort of just got me on the track to doing academic research. You know, I ended up um, going to Berkeley for graduate school uh, and worked with Bill Dietrich there, who's a phenomenal uh, geomorphologist. And um, I ended up, you know, staying sort of in my in my field of geomorphology, sediment transport, and um, and fluvial hydraulics, I guess, uh, that has led me to where I am today. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I, I know that um, you have a really interesting balance from what I can tell anyway, of you do is lab work and field work. And I'm just kind of curious, like on a day-to-day -day basis, when you're getting up and heading into work, what kind of gets you most excited? Can, can you repeat that question? Sure. Sorry. Just on a day-to-day -day basis, um, definitely let any of us know if we're breaking up or anything, but just on a day-to-day -day basis when you're going into work, you're getting ready for work, what aspects of your job or your research kind of get you most excited about the day? Um, 
Yeah, good question. So it, it sort of varies from, from day to day. You know, when I'm teaching, um, sometimes there are, there are classes that I get real excited about teaching, which is a fun part of being a professor, I think. Um, being able to interact with students in that way and, and get them excited about something new. Um, so teaching is a fun part of the job. Uh, I'm not teaching all the time. And um, research wise, there are different things that I find exciting, you know, depending upon on what's going on. Sometimes I might be working on a new proposal. Like maybe I'll be trying to form a new collaboration with um, other scientists or engineers uh, to study something new that I don't necessarily know all that much about. And so um, being able to uh, learn new things and try to figure out what are the interesting unanswered questions that are out there and how can we try to devise a research project that would allow us to answer them, um, that can be really exciting. Um, I also like to uh, think about just being able to answer questions. So that's sort of, you know, comes back to that proposal idea. Even if there's ongoing research, you know, maybe we run into uh, an unexpected finding and need to try to make sense of it, or we have some new data analysis problem that we might want to try to tackle in a unique way. Um, you know, just being able to be creative about approaches to different problems in uh, the natural and built environment and trying to understand kind of the way the world works and how to make sense of it. Um, that's, that's the kind of stuff that keeps me going. And so um, it's, it's, I think the most rewarding part of being a professor at a place like CSU is that uh, you can interact with talented people and, and talented students and work on things that you find interesting and that are, I think, important. So I like it. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the things that I really liked about the engineering aspect of it is getting to ask really important questions, understanding how things actually work, but keeping it very applicable to society at large. Yeah, just going going off of what you're talking about, um, were are there a couple of specific projects or one or two maybe from your past that um, kind of help characterize your work and what you've done? Um, do you feel like? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I've worked on a, a variety of topics. Um, for the most part, they sort of fall under the umbrella of geomorphology, hydraulics, hydrology, and sediment transport. Um, and um, some of the projects that I've done in the past that are, I think, fairly characteristic of the type of work that I do, meaning, you know, trying to answer basic questions about um, how the world works, how the Earth's surface processes work, um, and trying to use a combination of approaches, like you mentioned, Ben, with a combination of field data, numerical modeling, uh, physical modeling, flume studies, that kind of stuff. Um, I think that the work that I did in my PhD is a, a good example, the trying to understand um, how in gravel bed rivers, sediment sorts itself into patches of distinct grain size and sorting. Um, and so for, for that project, I approached it from a variety of, of ways. I did some field work you know, going out to rivers in California and um, looking at the beds and trying to sort of make sense of um, how the, the bed was sorted up into patches of sand and gravel and boulders and cobbles and everything else. Um, but, you know, most of that work was focused on kind of a combination of flume experiments and numerical modeling. And so uh, I participated in flume experiments at a couple of labs. We had a, a lab in um, Richmond, California, which is just a short bus ride from Berkeley. Um, on the San Francisco Bay where we did some experiments in a, a flume uh, there looking at how reductions in sediment supply change the sorting of a gravel bed experimental channel. Um, and that was tied in with some other research looking at how um, gravel augmentation, which is a practice that's used in the American West a lot to try to restore salmon uh, spawning habitat, how that sort of works. Um, trying to provide some guidance to 
um, people who are interested in dumping gravel into a river to try to basically create spawning habitat for, for fish. Um, and then I spent a month in Minnesota at the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory, uh, which is built on an island in the Mississippi River, uh, doing experiments pretty much around the clock uh, in a really large flume there uh, that was more of a near field scale experiment. It's almost like having a, a river inside the lab um, and forming alternate bars in the gravel bed channel and manipulating the sediment supply and making a lot of detailed measurements of um, the sediment transport and the hydraulics and the bed topography and the sorting. So um, there was a, a large experimental component and then that was complemented with uh, some collaborative work I did with John Nelson and Rich McDonald of the USGS Geomorphology and Sediment Transport Lab in Golden, Colorado, um, where I was working with them on uh, modifying their morphodynamic model, which is called FASTMIC, um, to be able to do numerical simulations of mixed grain size sediment transport. And so I ended up diving deep into Fortran coding uh, which is not something that a lot of people do these days, um, and and doing uh, some model modifications, some you know computer programming, uh, and then using the model to try to understand through numerical experimentation how uh, mixed grain size sediment transport uh, and and gravel bed morphodynamics work. And so it's trying to combine these multiple approaches to understand something that's really basic. You know, just going out, you go out to a river and you look down and you see that the bed is sorted into different patches and you can ask, you know, how does that happen? And it's not very straightforward, but um, it's an interesting thing to spend a lot of time working on and trying to understand. Definitely. Yeah, I think just the complexity of nature's and our difficulty in understanding it is pretty remarkable just continuously. It seems like Fortran is, um, still has a staying power in numerical modeling specifically. Is that, do you find that to be true compared to other languages? It does, yeah. I mean, um, there's all these legacy CFD codes and everything's written in Fortran. And it, and it is, I think, um, it is when it's written well, it's one of the fastest um, executing languages there are. And so um, yeah. I think the combination of kind of this legacy of codes just sort of evolving over time and not wanting to completely reinvent the wheel uh, along with the, the good performance that it has means that there's, there's still a lot of Fortran code out there. But what I think what people are doing now is um, maybe taking sort of existing Fortran code and then wrapping it in things like Python wrappers or right. you know, some of the stuff that the, the CSDMS group is doing, the community service dynamic modeling system um, based out of C Boulder. Uh, they have a, um, a sort of an online model portal where anyone who's put together any sort of like sediment model, regardless of the language, um, they have a, a team of people whose job it is to kind of um, wrap that up into a common, uh, common interface, I think is what they call it. And so, so yeah. Um, we're becoming, I think, less focused on individual programming languages and more on kind of interaction of, of codes that people have written in whatever they know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not to dwell on code too much, but it's really interesting, I think, the this is exactly what you're describing, the evolution where it's becoming more user-friendly and the amount of additional research that allows where you don't have to spend three years learning C++ or Fortran, you can learn some surface level and just call these other codes that are maybe a lot harder to look at. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna go back really quickly, um, Peter, you mentioned uh, kind of working all over the place, right? So, and you mentioned, you know, some of the, the fish spawning in the Pacific Northwest, and you mentioned working on the Mississippi and obviously going to school at East and on the West Coast. Um, how has, and particularly water resources is very impacted by where we are. So kind of how has your, the, the ability to have worked in all these different places impacted um, your, your experiences in water resources? So, I mean, I've definitely been influenced by the places that I've, I've lived and worked, you know, um, 
the the stuff that I did in college in Baltimore is a good example of um, we were looking at uh, problems that Baltimore had been experiencing with flooding and a lot of urbanizing places experience increased flooding because of the altered hydrologic response and the the part of Balt one of the parts of Baltimore that we were looking at is sort of an end member of that problem because it was developed in the late 1800s and nobody had any thought to try to control stormwater or anything and, and they basically put all of the runoff into an underground system of pipes which then outletted to uh, some some lower part of the watershed through a gigantic pipe and um, and it is one of the flashiest hydrologic responding watersheds in the United States because of that. Um, so, you know, working there made me think about sort of the effects of urbanization on uh, hydrologic response and flooding. And I've, I've continued to do some work in kind of urbanizing watersheds. The um, being in California for graduate school, there's a lot of um, gravel bed rivers there. And so focusing on gravel bed rivers was something that I was attracted to. Um, you know, being in Colorado, I've gotten involved in wildfire research, which the, you know, the summer that I moved to Colorado, there was um, the High Park fire, which burned just outside Fort Collins and was at the time, I think the second largest fire in Colorado. And now it's number six because we had the four largest fires in Colorado this past summer. But um, you know, that was the first thing that I started working on at CSU was post wildfire flooding and sedimentation. And I'm continuing to do that because we keep having wildfires, which is, you know, a, a major impact on water resources as well. Um, the city of Fort Collins had to essentially shut down the half of its water supply during the High Park fire because of all of the um, sediment and ash that was coming into the Poudre River at that time. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of stuff is, in a sense, um, I've, I've kind of been opportunistic, I guess, in, in the type of research that I've been working on based upon where I've been and what I've been working on and, and, and where I've been living. Um, and I think if I, if I was someplace else, I'd probably be doing other things. You know, I, I mentioned to you before we started that I had done a, a short course in Pakistan a couple of years ago. The, um, the Sindh Irrigation Department in southern Pakistan. Um, they operate all of the um, dams and barrages on the Indus River, which provides irrigation to most of the country there. And they wanted to learn more about sedimentation because they keep having to clean out their the areas behind their dams that fill up with sediment. Um, and I had to kind of adapt as I was going, I was there for about a week and I had to adapt midway through what I was teaching them because while most of my expertise and, and work and experience has been on gravel bed rivers, they're working on these huge lowland rivers that are filled with silt basically. And it's, um, you know, it's a different type of environment and they have different types of problems that they need to, to deal with. So um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely been influenced by my surroundings in terms of the types of problems that I think about and what I work on. I think that kind of leads us into this next question that I, I have for you, which is, um, it's really what do you see as the most pressing issues with regard to your field or research? And just kind of going off what you're saying there, it sounds like maybe that's um, dependent on where you're at and different parts of the globe, different parts of maybe probably the state even, but are there some, a few specific things that you really um, think are really important to address? Yeah, I mean, th there's, there's a lot of challenges um, that say river managers or, or water resource managers or people who are um, you know, trying to make decisions about how to how to deal with maybe disasters or um, water resources management problems um, that people are facing. And, you know, I think, I think one area that's been getting increasing attention and is continuing to become more and more uh, relevant is 
you know, everything that we have to do associated with dams, especially in the United States. Um, and there, there are a number of, there are a number of, of issues associated with dams that um, I think are, are fairly pressing. The first is that a lot of the dams in the United States are 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. Uh, they were not designed to last longer than that, which kind of reached the end of their design life from when they were built. And so consequently, um, the dam owners or the communities that um, manage the dams are faced with a bunch of decisions as, as far as do they want to try to relicense the dam? You know, do they want to take the dam out? Uh, do, they, do they want to um, mitigate the, you know, the effects of sediment that's built up behind the dam? Um, the, the total capacity of water storage behind dams has been declining uh, in the United States um, continuously because sediment is sort of filling up reservoirs. And um, some of the stuff that I've been involved with lately has been on the National Reservoir Sedimentation Team, um, which is kind of a group of people from federal agencies like the Bureau of Reclamation, Army Corps of Engineers, USGS, and others, uh, along with academic researchers like myself, um, to try to, I think, bring some visibility and develop some guidelines for things like dam removal and um, issues related to sediment, just dealing with managing the sediment that's been building up behind dams. Um, one of the interesting things that I worked on in the last year was a collaboration with Desiree Tulos, who Liz knows, and Roland Hotchkiss and Dave Wegner, um, where we were looking at the, um, the issue of permitting uh, that dam operators need to go through if they want to try to move sediment from the reservoir down into the downstream uh, reach below the dam. So one of the big problems that dams cause is they trap all the sediment and the downstream portion of the river below the dam is starved of sediment. And so there's all sorts of geomorphic changes and changes to the habitat that happen because of that lack of sediment supply that the dam has imposed. So there's, there's kind of a dual problem with the dam trapping sediment. The first is this downstream effect. And the second is that it's trapping the sediment and the reservoir is filling up with, with sediment and it's not gonna be able to hold any water at some point. It's gonna be, it's gonna no longer be a useful uh, structure for any reason. And so one approach that could potentially solve both of those problems is having a, a I guess, a, a reasonable way of bringing sediment from the reservoir to the downstream reach. If you can sluice it through the dam or dredge it and put it back in the river or something, there's, there's different ways that, that people can do that. And it's almost never done in the United States in part because uh, the way that the regulations have been written, just getting permits to, to pass sediment from the reservoir to the downstream reach is like impossible. It's, it's extremely challenging. And so it's generally easier for um, dam operators to just dig up the sediment and, and you know, stick it in a pile on the hill slope someplace else, as opposed to resupply the sediment downstream. Um, so sorry, just real quick. So the the challenge and the or the reason the permitting is difficult is because they think moving the sediment might damage the downstream owners or whoever. Yeah, that, that, down that's part of it. I mean, part of the issue is that sediment is classified as a pollutant, um, and sediment can be a pollutant if it, especially if it has like heavy metals that absorb to it or something like that. But um, the the problems that we were trying to focus on with this work that we were doing over the past year was, um, you know, trying to, I guess, encourage the regulatory agencies to maybe a, have, have a, a more open mind, I guess, as far as allowing people to just move the sediment downstream. Because in, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, uh, the, you know, the benefits would far outweigh any sort of risks, I think for doing that.
when you're working on a project like that, Peter, is it typically when you talk about work, working with like regulatory agencies, um, obviously that's a national problem. So are you working with organizations like FERC that are a national level or is it, do you see changes like that happening more in a state by state basis? Um, yeah, it depends. <clears throat> it probably depends on the specific problem. Um, in this, you know, in this example with the reservoir segmentation and stuff, um, I think it's more something that would have to be addressed by the US Congress. And so, um, you know, some of the stuff that we've been talking about as a committee is trying to um, develop materials that congressional aides might read, which then they could talk to their, you know, the congressman that they worked for, who then might bring this up in uh, a committee in the Congress, and then possibly at some point lead to a, a change in the regulatory policy. Um, so it's, I mean, it's pretty far afield from what I do on a normal day-to-day -day basis, you know, doing experiments in the lab and stuff, but um, it is, I think, important to try to um, try to make sure that, you know, the, what we're learning scientifically is going to maybe be able to make changes to society. Is that, sorry about the policy aspect questions, but is that, um, rooted still probably in the Clean Water Act, mm -hmm. like as far as back as the seventies, probably. Yeah, I think it's the Clean Water Act. Um, yeah, it's so yeah, interesting and ironic to see something that the science, it sounds like, is like, we need this to occur. And then the regulation saying, like, that's a bad thing, don't do it. It's pretty wild. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. We ended up writing a, um, a paper that's going to be, I don't think it's been published yet, but it's going to show up in EOS, which is the um, American Geophysical Union magazine, um, with some recommendations that we came up with. Um, and so, you know, our hope is that that's going to be a start, maybe, and, and people will start to think about this a little bit more. Definitely. All right. Um, I know there's been, I think I saw a graph somewhere along the way, there's actually a, a been a net reduction in the number of dams in the US maybe, but I'm assuming there are still new dams being built and it sounds like there's a need for a lot of um, dam renovation or restructuring. Are, are newer, do you, are you aware of newer um, implementation of dams are implementing some kind of um, sediment um, pathway I don't like or just any kind of technologies or approaches that are built into the dam itself so there's there's basically no new large dams that are being built in the United States that that era is pretty much over um, and um, so there you know a couple of a couple of things that this makes me think of one is um, dam removal you know, is, is becoming an increasingly used river restoration practice. And a, a lot of the motivation for what I've worked on has been trying to understand if you take out a dam and you have a sudden increase in sediment supply because of all the sediment that's built up behind the dam is now available to be transported downstream, what happens to it? How do rivers respond to changes in sediment supply? And so that, that's been the focus of a lot of, of the work that I've done. Um, your question though, about sort of new dams and new dam technology, um, and there, there's not a lot of new dam building going on, but, but I think that where it is happening, it's generally these smaller, what they call run of river dams. Um, the Obama administration um, did some regulatory changes that I think made it a little bit easier. There, there's less red tape to, to put up sort of these smaller structures, which might be for small hydropower projects, let's say. Um, and that's actually, that's an area that I'm interested in starting some new research. And I've, I've um, got kind of a proposal that I'm in the middle of working on to, to try to better understand how small run of river dams affect uh, sedimentation and morphodynamic processes around them. Um, because there's, there's kind of an assumption that a lot of people have that sediment just passes over small dams and they don't really pose a, a barrier to sediment, but that's not totally clear if that's the case. Um, right. And if, 
if it is or if it isn't, you know, the, the mechanisms by which sediment, sediment actually can move over these small run of river dams is not really very well known. Um, and I've, I've also heard about some sort of smaller dams being kind of dynamically operated, almost like a, um, like a balloon or something where they can kind of be deflated at certain flows and in, inflated at other flows and, and being able to kind of raise and lower dams at different times might be another sediment management approach that um, people could use for those types of structures. That's super cool. Yeah, I've heard of, um, I'm wondering if it relates to you, but in the context of, I guess, ecosystem restoration or stream um, restoration, uh, environmental flows and actually using dams to manage, you know, have, make sure you get like large flushing flows or that kind of thing. Is that something that's also considered with respect to geomorphology? Um, I, I think it hasn't been considered enough. Uh, you know, the a lot of the environmental flows uh, have, you know, they're, they're focused on like the biology, you know, they want to get um, certain, certain amount of days above a certain discharge for fish or something. And, and, and that is associated with, um, you know, some, sometimes the goals are to sort of like clean out the silt settled in the larger gravels of the bed downstream or something. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that that's also an area where, you know, there could maybe be some additional research and, and guidance that could be put together to try to think more holistically about what are the effects of um, sort of manually modifying the hydrograph of a river th right. through the environmental flows for, for not just, you know, biology, but, you know, what are going to be the geomorphic effects and the effects on sediment transport and everything else? It sounds like there's a lot of challenges and opportunities. Um, I guess, do you have any specific maybe advice or directions for early researchers or young researchers that are interested in maybe how to, uh, how to attack or approach solving some of these problems? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it is challenging. I think that, um, I think that the one of the more important things that somebody might be able to do is to have uh, a, tr try to get a sense of what do we have a good handle on and what don't we. So anything with sediment transport, um, if, you're, if you have a model or something, you're trying to calculate sediment transport rate for a given flow. Um, the, the number that that model spits out is not going to be, you know, don't take it as gospel. It's the, the, one of the biggest, you asked about the, the, you know, the big challenges in the field. And I think one of the big challenges that we face is that we're still not able to predict sediment transport rates better than within like an order of magnitude or a factor of five or a factor of two or something. And, and that's kind of a, a, a big problem if you're trying to make a precise quantitative prediction about what's going to happen if you do something. Um, so, um, you know, people who are, are getting into this field or are working in this field, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to kind of identify what are some of these sources of uncertainty that we have in the different aspects of how everything interacts in, in a fluvial system. Um, and then try to find something and just try to improve it a little bit. You know, if we can make small improvements in, uh, you know, our understanding of what flows do sediment start to move at, or, um, you know, what causes sediment to deposit in certain locations and how does vegetation affect things or, you know, um, being able to make, make progress in those types of, you know, sub questions that uh, when you combine them, lead to the, the um, I guess, a better understanding of, of how the entire system works and how we can model it and make predictions. Um, you know, being able to identify those problems and then, and then come up with something that will do an incremental improvement in our understanding of the system is sort of the best thing to do. And then 
if you are in, on the decision-making side of things, um, acknowledging the uncertainty and, and you know, being sort of flexible in, in your interpretation of the results of models or, or whatever else um, so that you can maybe be able to dynamically uh, change your approach if you need to. Um, if something's not working out exactly as planned just due to the inherent uncertainty in our ability to, to make quantitative predictions of sediment transport and that kind of stuff. Your comment about models just reminded me of that, that quote of all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And it feels like increasingly as engineers, we are expected to do these quantitative values and you put numbers into Excel and it gives you to five decimal places. And you're like, it's not, that's not right. Um, and so it seems like there is this, uh, in some ways a shift of you were talking about how um, a lot of environmental flows are focused on biology and they're potentially needing to be these, these bigger collaborations because we can't know everything about the hydraulics and the sediment and the biology and the ecology. Like that's just so much for one person. Um, so with these kind of bigger issues, have you started seeing, um, I guess, collaborations across disciplines more in the recent years? Yeah, I think that's that's definitely the direction that um, scientific research in general is headed, at least in, in this area. Um, and uh, agencies like the National Science Foundation are trying to encourage that. So um, the, the, one of the big focuses that the NSF is now doing is what they call convergence research, which is kind of a, you know, encouraging transdisciplinary collaboration and trying to get people from different fields to, to talk to each other and work with each other and try and try to get a common, I guess, a common vocabulary to attack these challenging and, and wicked problems. Um, so that's, that's definitely, I think, becoming increasingly essential to be able to, to work with, um, you know, work with, have physical scientists, work with life scientists, work with social scientists um, to try to attack these, these problems from multiple um, perspectives and um, converge on, on a solution. So that's, yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Liz, that um, these problems are not one dimensional by any means. You know, they're, they interface with all sorts of um, parts of society and, and many different academic fields as well. You've addressed some of the, um, the, the problems that you see in the future in terms of the, the technical challenges. I mean, you're talking a lot about, about dams and some of the problems associated with that. Um, to address those, do you feel like there is a large component of, of governance or other areas that, that we have to address as well in order to address those changes? Or do you think that the answer is largely technical and we just need to go fix our dams and have them not collapse? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, um, I guess one, one way that, um, that governance can maybe improve things is, is through the way that they prioritize funding. You know, all scientific research is, is driven in part by, by funding and being able to, to get support to do the kind of research that you think is important. And um, so I suppose, um, you know, agencies like the, the NSF um, can encourage certain types of research if they want by prioritizing certain types of, um, of projects that, or, you know, programs that they might want to uh, develop. So, you know, this convergence research is a good example, I think. Um, but then, you know, there is, like you said, the infrastructure side of things. Infrastructure is a, a, a major issue and um, between, you know, things like dam relicensing and removal or um, just general, you know, stream restoration projects that are being done all over the place for, for whatever reason, whether it's motivated by some sort of, um, you know, ecological impetus or, you know, community wants to build a whitewater park or something and, and um, revitalize 
the part of town that the river runs through or, you know, whatever else there's, there's, they're going to run into um, questions and decisions that are best, I think, guided by uh, research that, that we've been doing or could do in the future. And so um, having that societal impetus to, you know, continue to address important questions related to uh, geomorphology and hydraulics and hydrology is important. That's really cool. And I apologize. I have a follow-up question that is kind of from a couple of questions ago. I apologize for kind of being out of order here, but I can't help but wonder, the uncertainty seems like such a big challenge and um, just thing to address in general with regards to the modeling and predicting um, you know, different geomorphological responses. I'm curious if, um, is that uncertainty so extreme that it's kind of just like, like a uniform distribution where like it could be anywhere, like it's somewhere in here. Are we able to get to the point where we're quantifying distributions of uh, potential responses? Does that make sense? Yeah, sort of. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't know if I don't know if people have approached it quite that way, with you know trying to think about distributions of responses associated with uncertainty. I guess I guess that's sort of been done. Um, I mean, I, I think that I think with this question about uncertainty specifically related to sediment transport. Um, I, I think that the path forward that, that we're starting to make progress on with that um, is related to the improved computing power that's becoming increasingly available, which I think could lead to maybe better characterization of these distributions like you're talking about. Um, but, you know, specifically, the, I think the future, um, which might provide a little bit more certainty in, in these types of um, modeling problems with sediment transport is uh, we're getting better at being able to model the full physics of everything that's happening. So rather than rely on um, some sort of parameterization of important processes like the, the, the shear stress on the bed at which sediment starts to move or something, we can actually combine hydraulic and uh, particle modeling in a supercomputing environment to compute the full distribution of forces that every single sediment particle is experiencing. Um, it's with, really cool. Like, improved turbulence modeling and, and that kind of thing. And that can only really be done at small scales right now. Um, but, you know, it's getting better and better as, as computers become more and more powerful. And so, you know, we're, 50 years ago, that would have been impossible to imagine. You know, we, we would have sort of really simple uh, approaches to try to make these types of calculations. And now with the work that some people in our field are, are doing, you can have a full 3D you know, uh, simulation that gets all of the turbulent structures and you can um, quantify the effects of individual bursts and sweeps and the fluid on individual particles and see how the they interact with each other and so it you know i think that um i think that the the next couple of decades probably is going to see some pretty significant advances in our understanding of uh how sediment transport and fluid flow sort of works and how we're able to um to i guess numerically quantify you know what sediment transport rates are and, and hopefully translate that to improvements in uh, larger scale models that might be used by decision makers i think that's super cool and exciting <laughs> yeah you should do it you should do another phd that's <laughs> so it's hard not to. It's uh, it's so tempting just to stay, just to keep studying new things. Yeah. 
Um, well, it seems like there's just so many, uh, we've talked about a lot of different um, big scale problems and, and how, our, how your research uh, directly relates to those and stuff. Um, but we do kind of want to take a bit of a step back and just, I guess, keep things casual and get to know you a little bit better. Um, and so we wanted to do a couple of fun questions. I guess we'd classify them. Um, and so my first question to you was, do you have a favorite restaurant that you like in Fort Collins? So I haven't been to a restaurant in a year. Um, I miss <laughs> <laughs> I've done some takeout, but um, back when I did go to restaurants, um, I think my favorite one is probably the farmhouse at Jessup Farm. I don't know if you've been there. It's like a, it's like a nice special occasion place, I think. Um, been there a few times and I've always really enjoyed that. So I like that for, you know, quicker, like non sit down uh, type food. Um, I've, I've always enjoyed the Waltzing Kangaroo, which is a place on Elizabeth. It's a Australian uh, meat pie shop it's run by an Australian guy um and that my kids love the Waltz and Kangaroo too so um we have like a freezer full of frozen pies from there that if I don't know what to make them for dinner I'll throw a couple of pies in the oven and heat them up I like that name in and of itself makes me want to go that's just a great <laughs> name I think the yeah. Waltz and Kangaroo <laughs> Yeah. Right. Puts a nice image in your head. You're like, what does that look like? <laughs> so speaking of COVID, have you picked up any new hobbies in the past year or are there hobbies that you've continued during this time to stay sane? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think I do more crosswords now than I did before COVID. Um, and uh, I, you know, I've, I've always been a, a runner. So I, I've continued to run, although um, with the fires that we had last summer and you know snow and and ice and cold and everything, um, it's not always easiest to get outside to go running. So um, one thing that we got in probably May was we bought a spin bike. So I've been doing a lot of spin classes in my basement as well. Um, so that's been fun. It's been fun to pick that up. Um, so I, yeah, I don't necessarily have any new hobbies thanks to COVID, um, other than sitting in my house. <laughs> um, yeah, just trying yeah. to stay active in a safe way and, and, you know, um, keep my mind occupied. It was a yeah, little too. intense with that smoke at the end of the summer leading right into winter. It, it's like coronavirus, the smoke right into winter really it was needing to get outside in some nice weather. <laughs> it was like the end of days. I mean, and and it snowed like on Labor Day, which <laughs> is, I mean, it was, it was the, the fire was burning. It was raining ash and, then, and, and the skies were orange. And then it stopped raining ash and it started snowing actual snow. It was just like, it was crazy. The world is coming to an end. I mean, but in some ways it felt right. I remember there was this one week sometime maybe in September and it was blue skies and sunny. And then, and then like that weekend it hit and it was just, you know, gray, yeah, the raining ash. And I was like, wow, this feels so much more comfortable. I'm so much more used to this now. Like it just, it just fit the, the vibes of the time, but. <laughs> the snow was actually a relief to some extent to knock down some of the ash, but then you're still just stuck inside or not able to do a lot of that more stuff. Um, yeah, I remember I saw it, uh, um, like one of the local news stations had like a weather map that they popped up. And it says the state of Colorado and it had fire around the entire, you know, it had, they had like the, you know, the cartoon of fires all over the, <laughs> the border. And then in the middle, it had snow. It was just like, <laughs> yeah, 2020 was a good one. <laughs> Awesome. Um, yeah, let's start kind of wrapping up. Ask a few just follow up questions here. Um, and we'll, yeah, we'll kind of start wrapping up. So, you brought up a lot of really great um, potential paths forward as far as research and a, a bunch of challenges that need to be addressed. And um, I, your work's just really interesting. I really appreciate the kind of 
attempt to have this physical understanding of all the processes. I think that's personally, I just think that's super cool. Um, my question is, do you have any specific advice kind of generally for new researchers thinking kind of maybe undergrads to grad students that are really trying to get into research or um, in academia in general? Again, not necessarily like technical advice, but just generally how might you approach that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I think one of the most important things to do is try to find something that you're interested in and try to find a good mentor to help, help guide you through that. Um, so like when I was thinking about graduate school myself, you know, I, um, first of all, I, I had a great mentor at my undergrad, um, my senior thesis advisor, Jim Smith, who's a hydrologist at Princeton. Um, I was talking to him about graduate school and I was thinking about it and you know, his advice was find, find, find the advisor that you wanna work with. You know, find somebody who you think would be great to, to work with, especially for a PhD, which can be a very long process. Um, and so that's, that's sort of how I ended up working with Bill Diedrich at, at Berkeley, because um, I was interested in, in working with him and you know, I thought he did really cool stuff. And, and that turned out to be a great decision. Um, and when I was working with Bill, I, I would say that the most important thing that I learned um, besides you know, trying to improve my ability to write communication is super important and Bill's a great, I mean, he's a, he's a very, um, let's say harsh editor of writing, but it improves you. Um, the thing that I really learned from him was how to ask questions. Like the, especially if you wanna get into kind of academic science, being able to identify and ask questions is really like super important. So whatever field you're in, um, I think that that's something to really try to be conscious of and cognizant of and try, try to improve your ability to get a sense of what it is that, that you're working on and what the unanswered questions are and, and be able to ask those questions because then that will provide kind of a map to the rest of your career potentially if that's the path that you end up choosing. Awesome. I really appreciate that advice. And, um... I think it's good for me to hear, even though I'm already my PhD, it's just really well-rounded advice, I think. I, I know at times I've struggled with um, being tempted to pursue like a skill or something for the sake of the skill and losing track of the question. That is something my advisor has been able to help me a ton with, is like, say question-oriented, what's the knowledge gap? And so I really appreciate that. Being reminded of that time and time again is very important to me. <laughs> Yeah. I think that uh, even even as a master's student, uh, I can say having worked with you, Peter, is definitely, I feel like, made the grad school experience. And I feel like, depending on how you work with an advisor, it can make or break that experience, even for two years, because even as a master's, it's not it's not as long as a PhD, but it's long enough that if you don't get along, then it's it's going to be a really long two years, and it's already a, a difficult time. But it's, it's been a pleasure, and it's definitely, um, yeah, I feel like, been a great experience, like, having having that that mentorship, so... Yeah, great. Awesome. Um, yeah, I guess if anybody wanted to get in touch with you, is it okay for them to reach out and email? Or is there a good way, a preferred way that you have for people to reach out to you? Yeah, e email is is the best. Um, I don't answer my phone if it's an unknown number. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. They've gotten really good at disguising the unknown numbers now too, so yeah, it's a shame. Um, Awesome. We'll add your email address to the intro slide and the outro slide. And actually, it might be currently showing over here if you're watching the video. <laughs> um, awesome. Peter, I really, really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, it was really insightful. I learned a lot. And um, yeah, I guess my last note before we kind of sign off is my main interaction with you in grad school is through hydrometry. And that was still hands down one of the funnest classes I've had. I mean, I partly put it outside, but it's just super practical skills that I feel like we were able to get. And um, 
which is a lot of fun. So I, I really appreciate that. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, absolutely. I recommend it to anyone and everyone. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. And um, thank you listeners for joining the Environmental and Water Resources Podcast with the Civil Environmental Engineering Department at Colorado State University, brought to you by EWRI CSU. Be kind to each other. It's good. I thought you were going to ask me about my first concert. <laughs> oh, well, what was your first concert? That in. <laughs> it, was, it was it was MC Hammer. Oh really? Oh. Yeah, and and he, he had three opening acts: TLC, Joe C, and Boys to Men. That's awesome. Amazing. I, just so you know, this will get edited, and it might be in the outro, but that will <laughs> definitely appear. Yeah, that's definitely a piece of knowledge people need about about you. Yeah. <laughs>